I, hey everybody, my name's Jeremy. I work at Synadia. I get to work on a really cool open source project called Nats. Um, and I'm trying something new today. Uh, I'm actually using Restream to stream in a lot of places. Um, so I'm actually gonna have some, it uh, looks like Stream Elements is coming in and telling me that I'm live, which is great. I'm actually first um, going to check that everything is kind of working on all these different platforms because I think I'm doing um, LinkedIn, I'm doing YouTube, uh, I'm uh, obviously doing Twitch um, and and also X slash Twitter. I, I don't like calling it X. Um, but today we're going to be um, just kind of casually working together. Uh, I got a little bit of Go to write. Um, I, I really, I'm, I'm preparing for my next video, which will probably come out um, Monday or Tuesday, um, all about Nats consumers. And so um, I figured it would be kind of fun to show everybody the process that uh, that I go through to prepare some content. I already have some notes and I already know what I'm going to talk about. That's actually, that, that, that one kind of takes a while. Um, I have a huge backlog, but knowing kind of the pacing of it all and everything kind of takes a, a little bit of time to, to get down. Um, so today we're going to write some code examples and go uh, related to Nats consumers. We'll also kind of look at populating our, um, we'll look at populating our data uh, via Benthos. So if you haven't used Benthos before, um, you're going to have a lot of fun kind of learning a little bit more about, uh, about it. And yeah, so before we dive into that, I'm gonna quickly kind of just uh, go back over here to, to my camera view. And I'm just gonna quickly kind of look at Twitter and see if uh, I am, live or if it's correctly posted. Um, let's go ahead and see. It looks like I am live, which is great. Um, let's go over to LinkedIn and see if this works out as well. Um, and I might even just add uh, Nats IO here. Let's see if LinkedIn properly worked or if I'm if I'm going live there. It is, okay, cool, cool, cool. And I think Twitch and YouTube are probably also working. I am going through the Synadia YouTube, so if you uh, happen to find me there, that's great. Um, let's go ahead and see if this also works. Um, doo -doo -doo. I'm on the wrong channel. Let's go over here. And let's see if I have any live content going at the moment. Um, doo -doo -doo. Lives. Yep, we are good. We are live. Looks like we already have some live viewers. So hey, everybody, feel free to jump into the chat. Um, I want to test out Restream and make sure that we're getting chat messages kind of coming in from all of the different channels. Um, so be sure to say hi and uh, what's up. And and again, this is going to be casual. I'll probably be working for the next, I don't know, four hours or so. So feel free to kind of pop in, ask questions whenever you want. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about Nats, we'll talk about Benthos, and um, you'll get to see me kind of write some code, but I'm happy to kind of, uh, I have chat right up here. I'm happy to kind of look um, anytime you guys have some questions, um, I'll be happy to answer them. So, um, hey, how's it going? Uh, Cuckoo Bao from, uh, from Eastern Europe. Um, excited to talk more about Nats with you. Um, we'll do some, some data streaming stuff today. I'm going to jump in to Twitter and I'll just make another um, quote post for this and I'll tag Nats. So if I knew how to use Twitter properly, um, let's go over here. Uh, hopefully the stream looks all right. Um, I am using Restream for all of this uh, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what my upload speed looks like, but we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll see where that goes. And I know there's a little bit of a delay on my end, um, obviously, because it's uh, feeding into a bunch of different streaming services at this moment. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and quote tweet this. And I'll say, um, doing, uh, I'm officially live on a bunch of different services chatting about nets. Okay. Invent those. Cool. All righty. This is looking good. We are good to go. We got a repost. And um, yeah, let's dive straight into it. So, um, the thing that I'm going to be doing today, that I'm going to be working on today, is uh, mostly around um, around creating Nats consumers. And one of the things I wanted to highlight is, um, if you guys don't know already, I, I have a YouTube series called Rethink Connectivity, and lately we've been talking all about Nats Jetstream. I've talked about 
um, which if you don't know, Nats and Nats Jetstream is just a really, really awesome platform for, for data streaming, for, um, for really all kinds of stuff. And, and that's precisely what I wanted to highlight today as we looked into consumers. Because if you compare you know, tools like Kafka or Pulsar or RabbitMQ or anything kind of in like that messaging space, I think one of the superpowers of Nats is, and, and one of the ways that it really truly does stand out from that, that competition, is how flexible it is. And a lot of its flexibility, sure, there's a ton of flexibility in streams, and I think I highlighted that in, in previous videos. Um, but there's also so much flexibility in the consumers um, to the point where if you're doing anything like an event sourcing setup or you're implementing something like, you know, CQRS, um, I feel like Nats is just like right at home there where you can take this idea of a, you know, you can take this idea of a stream and um, that's like your source of truth, right? That's where all the data lives. And the consumers are like these really cool, very advanced windows into that stream um, to the point where you can build an entire application lifecycle um, pretty much just out of configuring a bunch of different consumers. So that's what we're going to be looking into today um, and, and kind of prepping. Uh, this is going to result in probably later tonight, I'll actually record the video with all the examples and stuff and it'll be much, much shorter, much easier to, uh, to kind of um, go through. Uh, but hey, you guys are the first adopters in kind of going through this process and we'll see if we kind of take away anything and, and you'll be able to kind of help shape and mold uh, what this next video on the Sanadia YouTube channel looks like. So hey, everybody joining in, um, looks like we got some folks from YouTube, which is really great. Um, I'm also on Twitch and LinkedIn. Uh, again, if your platform does support the chat, feel free to jump in and uh, say hi. Um, we can also just, I'm here to answer any questions about Nats and about what we're working on. So um, all right, so let's get started. I'm going to go ahead and pull up. Oh, do you know what? I want to do one more thing, which is I want to post on the NAT Slack that we are live. So let me go over to the Sanadia YouTube channel, and we will go ahead and do that. All right, Sanadia YouTube. Let's go over to our channel, and we have our live here. I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm muted. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead and share this link. Oops. Let's go ahead and share this link. And I will go ahead and post it on to our Nats Slack, which is over here in this other window that you can't see. Um, let's just go ahead and go into general. And I'm going to say, uh, hey, uh, Nats community. If I can spell, I'm live talking about. Nats and Benthos, in case you'd like to come say hi and learn about Nats consumers. Okay. I'm going to actually do the same thing just in Synadia Slack, so let me go ahead and do that. Okay. Here we go. Okay, now we're ready to go. Okay, sweet. So um, one of the things that I wanted to do when talking about Nats consumers was first we need like a stream with a bunch of data in it. And so I, I figured it would be kind of cool if we, um, instead of just like putting a bunch of like, you know, very basic dummy data in there is if we kind of populated this stream with data that, you know, was somewhat meaningful, still obviously faked data, but, but something that we could... Um, actually really work with. And so I wanted to kind of showcase uh, Benthos as a plugin here to, to be able to do that because um, Benthos is one, it's just a really, really cool kind of stream processing tool. Um, and it has first class support for NATS, which is great. Um, the other thing that I think Benthos is really, really good at that I just like kind of pulling off the shelf and using is that they have this, this input um, called generate which basically allows you to just generate a bunch of dummy data um, using the faker library. Um, and so, you know, inside of Bloblang, we have like these fake methods. Um, let's see if I can find it. Um, let's search fake. There we go, Bloblang functions. So uh, we can get all kinds of info here, you know, latitude, longitude, Unix time, date, time string, um, all of that. 
And so what I'm going to do here is uh, I'll use this kind of faker function or fake function um, to kind of mock out a bunch of fake data. And we'll insert that into our Nats stream um, or our Jetstream stream. And we will uh, start playing with it uh, in various ways um, with Nats consumers. So let's, uh, let's dive in. Uh, I'm going to quit out some of these applications because I just have way too much stuff open. Um, all right, so it looks like I already have something. I'll just start from scratch here. So the way Benthos works is uh, it's a very simple, operationally simple stream processing library where you have, um, you know, basically you have a, my editor is going to work. You have an input and then you have, you know, some level of like processors in between that input and the output. And the cool part about Benthos is that it connects with so many different services, Nats being one of them. It also has just a bunch of like, um, has a bunch of utility functions and and ways that you can kind of, you know, munge data in various formats and everything like that. Um, so it's just a really good connector framework, a really good kind of like, you know, potential ETL pipeline or, um, you know, anything like that, um, data streaming pipeline. And so what we're, again, what we're going to do today is we're going to use the generate function to, or the generate input to just like throw a bunch of data into uh, Jetstream so we can uh, start playing with it. So uh, first things first, uh, I am connected to Synadia Cloud and I'm going to go ahead and pull that up right now. Uh, for those who are familiar with Nat, Synadia Cloud is just a fully um, hosted version of NATS. It's a, it's global, um, meaning we just have servers like all over the place and, um, it's, it's really easy to kind of get started with, with NATS via Synadia cloud. Um, and you know, I can just go ahead and create an account and start jumping in and start creating streams and everything like that, which I believe I already have. Yeah. Yeah. So this is from one of my previous videos. I have a jobs stream over here with a couple consumers and let's go ahead and just create another stream. So I could actually do this straight from Synadia Cloud if I wanted to. Um, I'm gonna call this orders and I'm going to say um, full life cycle of orders. So what I'm thinking we're gonna do here is like build some sort of an event driven architecture where we may have, um, let's go ahead and uh, just take a look at this readme over here. Um, let's just say uh, orders. So imagine that we have full life cycle of orders where, oh, here we go, I already have some stuff here, where we might have some states. We're gonna use Benthos to generate some data. We are going to uh, model an order processing workflow and um, the subject hierarchy is gonna look something like this. And so maybe you have you know, a e-commerce site or something that has, you know, some form of like commerce where you order something, it gets delivered, um, but there's a bunch of states uh, essentially representing an order. And so what we want to do is instead of like having a bunch of jet stream streams for, for this, for this thing, um, let's just put everything in one stream and let's actually model the subjects for this. Um, and one of the really big benefits of using this is because you can just throw all that data in the stream and you can use consumers to kind of filter all that stuff out and, and really create like completely, almost completely different access patterns of this data um, through the consumer model. So this is again, like it's something that's a really good fit for, um, for event sourcing kind of architectures. It's also just like a really good um, example of like, or expression, I guess, of what you could do with something like CQRS. Um, where, you know, the data is all written into a stream by like publishing an event, but then it's kind of read out or projected into consumers in various different ways. Um, not quite going as far as saying, oh, they're going into different like databases or anything like that, um, which is very much like an event sourcing architecture, but it's kind of the precursor to that, which is like, I have a big bundle of data and I want to be able to kind of look at it in the way that I want and on my terms. Um, and I think that's the, uh, you know, that, that, that's the real special thing about this. Um, uh, YK high, um, or YK H I says Benthos has the best mascot. I agree. The Benthos blobfish is pretty freaking amazing. Um, I, I, I really do love it. Um, 
let's let's kind of bring it back up here. The other cool thing is, um, so I, I'm I'm buddies with uh, with Ash, who is the maintainer of Benthos, and he sent me this cool thing here. Let me go grab it. One sec. Okay, so, um, and I, I still, so I'm in process of kind of redoing my Raspberry Pi cluster. And so I have a cool, oh, did, no, do I not have a Bentho sticker on here? I don't. I have a cool NAT sticker right here. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can. And then I have a really cool Sanadia sticker right here. This is my Raspberry Pi cluster. And if you're interested, I'll do a stream or I'll do like a, um, a, vi a series of videos kind of getting this set back up. Um, with NATS and with Jetstream. And also what I want to do, and I know we're working on this at Synadia, if you guys haven't heard about NEX, N-E-X, it's the kind of new project that we have at Synadia called the NATS Execution Engine. And um, it's basically like a, it, it runs workloads. So it's like a, you know, a runtime for your, your binaries. You could, you know, eventually run containers on it. You could run serverless functions. Um, and uh, you can do that all through, you know, Nats kind of being that control plane for it. And so actually that's a new project that I have that I want to set up as this Raspberry Pi cluster and having Nex and Nats set up on it. So we could just like run all of our workloads very, very easily. Um, the reason I brought that up though, is I, I swear I have Bentho stickers somewhere, but Honestly, I have a, a house full of three children, and they probably used all of them. I bet you. I bet you we have some blobfish on our water bottles. Okay. Um, all right, back to the fun. Um, when is Nats coming to ARM? Uh, that's a great question. So I know we want to get Nex working on ARM, um, and so that's something that the team is kind of uh, looking into. Well, actually, I think Nex. That Nats does work on ARM. Um, I might be confused about the question, but yeah, like we, we do support ARM for uh, for Nats servers and everything like that. I run them just fine. In fact, a lot of my demos, especially the recent ones in the AI space, they're, they've all been running on on ARM architectures. Um, but I think for Nex, uh, right now they were only supporting um, x86, but uh, very soon here, we'll probably get an ARM build out here, like within the next week, I hope. Fingers crossed. Um, all righty. So I got a little bit distracted. Let's go back to some of this code here and start writing. So uh, so we're going to be creating a, a stream that has a bunch of data, orders data in it, um, where it's the, the subject's going to be called orders.location. I'm going to just do simplistic locations. Um, and then, oh, K Bray, hey, thanks for jumping on the stream. This is super fun. Um, hopefully, we'll have a lot, lot more of these. I know every time I stream, I'm like, I need to do this more. But I I'm serious this time. I got a brand new setup. Um, I got a brand new role at Synadia where um, you know it's now encouraged for me to do stuff like this. And and I actually have a strategy, more of a strategy of kind of helping this be a catalyst for putting out more content, not only just doing streams, but repurposing these streams and also using it to kind of help build, you know, what these videos end up being. Um, so yeah, I'd love feedback as we're kind of walking through a lot of this. Um, and we'll, we'll have a lot of fun along the way building this out. So we have our order subject, we'll do orders location, the order ID, and then the status. And here's all the different kind of statuses or states that we're going to be putting in here. We might not put all of these in here that there's like 10 or uh, 11, 10. Um, so yeah, we might not put all these in here, but let's go ahead and use Benthos to at least generate some of this data. Okay, so um, jumping into Benthos, I believe I have, I just built Benthos. I been, built Benthos not too long ago. Okay, oh, I built, built Benthos this morning. Okay, cool. Um, so let's go ahead and start creating a config for Benthos. Um, and bear in mind, I'm not a Benthos expert. I also haven't been writing Benthos for a while. Um, so I might actually be a bit rusty at it, which might be a good thing because we'll, we'll walk through a lot of this together. So um, like I said, Benthos is a pretty cool stream processing software. Um, the one thing I want to do is kind of just fire this up once and kind of use this watcher uh, flag so we can just kind of watch for changes in the con config file and, um, you know, have that all be good. So we'll also add the chilled flag because if there's a linter, we don't want it to, to just fail and, uh, exit.
but I think that's all we need. Um, so let's go ahead and create, we don't already have one. We have this seed.yaml. I think that's a good enough name, but I'm gonna go ahead and put this into a benthos folder and I'll just rename this uh, benthos seed.yaml. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we have a benthos directory. We have a seed.yaml. We don't need any processors, but we need an input. We don't even need an output because by default, Benthos um, outputs to standard out. The Really the thing we need is we need to start using this kind of generate command so we can start generating some data. And I have some X notifications coming in, which is great. Um, I don't, I have no idea how it works streaming to X or if, even if X comments come in this way. But if you are watching from Twitter or from X, um, hi everybody, this is cool. If you want to comment, you can join us on YouTube at the Synadia channel or you can find me on Twitch at Code Gangsta, um, whatever you want to do, it's up to you. But uh, be sure to, you know, add some comments. I like trying to interact with folks and uh, this is what makes the streams really fun. Okay, so our input is going to be generate. Let's go ahead and look up that generate command in Benthos. So generate messages at a given interval using a bloblang mapping. Bloblang's cool because it's just a little tiny language that allows you to add new fields or remove fields from um, the best way I could say it is just like from structured data. But you, uh, what I think of in my mind is just like JSON. Obviously it's not JSON and it can, but it can become JSON very easily. Um, but that's what I have in my head when I, when I see that. And obviously like this is JSON as an example. Um, Okay, cool. So it has kind of an interval, uh, what it wants to output. It has a count, and you could throw these things into batches as well. So it's really easy to generate data. It's also kind of a cool thing to fake like an actual live stream of data coming in. Um, as an example, here's like 100 rows outputting some stuff. So I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to paste it in. That makes it really easy. So let's go ahead and run Benthos. I'm going to say uh, watch chilled and I'm going to pass it the configuration file of Benthos seed.yaml and um, watch, ah, it's watcher, not watch. There we go. Okay, cool. So it's outputting all this data, which is great. Um, and what we could do is we could just like take this as it is and just start shoving it into Nats if we wanted to. Um, hey, Sergey from Montreal. Nice. I'm actually going to be in Montreal. Um, not too, you know, far from here. I'm going to be visiting, you know, some potential Nats users. Um, I have, uh, you know, a speaking engagement that I will be at. Um, so yeah, um, my first time in Montreal, maybe you could, uh, you could let me know. <laughs> What, what I should be doing, because I have no idea. I've never actually been to Canada before in my life. Um, what, what would be cool to do in Montreal? I'd love to, I'd love to hear it. Uh, okay, so we're outputting some data. Um, the, in Bloblang, root basically represents the data as it's uh, in the data that will be output from that mapping. Um, and so I can start just modifying that, that uh, root. Oh, John, hey, nice to see you again, dude. I'm glad that you, uh, that you joined the uh, the glad that you joined the stream. Um, we'll have to catch up and maybe when I'm in Montreal, we, we should say hi. So, um, okay, so let's try, um, I'm gonna just say root.id equals one, two, three, just to verify that all of this kind of works. Cool. So now it's outputting data. It's outputting a hundred of them at no interval. I'm just gonna say, um, ah, let's see, a hundred milliseconds. Nah, 500 milliseconds for now. And so that's going to update Every half a second, it's going to start outputting some new data, which is great. Um, so let's go back to that uh, fake function that we had in Blobling. And this is where we could start passing in some fake data. And so we want to have like a fake ID of sorts. And so we have JWTs. Um, there, I know we could do random integers, but we probably, you know, we probably want to do something like a UUID of sorts. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, I find a UUID somewhere. Fake UUID hyphenated. Sure. That's fine. We'll copy that and we'll paste it in. And now we're generating UUIDs that are all, all unique. 
So we now have an order ID. And you know what? We don't want hyphens in here because we probably want to take this ID and throw it into a Nats subject. So um, can I just do UUID? Let's see if that lets me do it. No, I can't. Um, I could just do random int. I think that's probably fine. Um, we'll just do random int probably does what a 64 bit, 32 bit int. Yep. Okay. 64 bit int. So that's also fine too. Let's just do random int as a function. Cool. All right. So we have IDs for all of these orders. Um, we could probably also just store the data that we want to embed in this subject um, in here too. So we can say uh, that, you know, root dot location is US. We probably want to do a random, a randomization between the US and Canada, because since we have some folks from Montreal here, and uh, let's just say the EU. Um, the reason that this kind of stuff is cool and, and why you would want to embed this inside of like a NAT subject is because um, obviously there's like lots of data sovereignty rules, right? And NATS actually gives you the flexibility to be like, oh, we'll collect this data and we might keep it around for a little bit, but maybe we'll split or mirror this data in, in the place where it actually needs to be um, for, for the long term. And so you can kind of get past a lot of that, that data sovereignty um, stuff. Um, uh, or you could even just say we have completely separate streams and we want to split them based off of, you know, subjects and, and things like that. So, you know, you got a lot of flexibility there. Um, just as a reference, I'm going to say, um, you know, subject template is going to be orders dot whatever we had here. Orders dot ID or nope, sorry, I got it wrong. Orders dot location dot ID dot status yeah so we want the status in here as well um, and then we want to be able to kind of choose from a random string um, what this looks like so i think we could do something like a random int with a max and select it from an array um, but let's kind of look at that I, I think there's like an index function or something like that um, go ahead and look. So these, we are over in blob langs functions. If we go over to methods, this is what we'll probably find um, how we access this. So um, in the case of a, we don't need string manipulation. We want object and array methods. Okay. Yeah. So there's an index method here. So we can say, you know, this dot names index one. Um, I think we could do array literals here if we really wanted to. Otherwise, I, there are the concept of variables, but um, we could just say uh, random int and give it a max of whatever this length was. Um, so, I mean, I guess there is a length somewhere here as well. Um, let us see. Length. Here we go. I think it's just that. Um, yeah, let's go ahead, because I haven't looked at this in a while. I know that there's a way to declare variables in blob lang. Here we go, just with the let syntax. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to say uh, let uh, locations, because I'm mixing uh, I'm mixing countries and the European Union. Um, okay, we'll just say US doesn't make much sense, but let's go ahead and go for it. Um, and it looks like this failed. Let's say locations index random int max is locations.length. Let's see if that failed to apply config, failed to init updated stream, failed to init input. Um, param max must not be dynamic. Interesting. Um, I guess we cannot do that. I'm sure there's a way to dynamically do it, but for now we'll just throw three in there. Um, and another little reference message. Um, message is empty. The reason for this is I think we have a let here um, and we need to, or maybe it's just that we have a, maybe it's just YAML that's the issue. 
Um, unable to reference message is structured, message is empty. Hmm, so looks like we do have root dot new dike. Oh, I, I know what it is. We have to reference the variable like this. There we go. Okay, cool. So we're generating a location. Um, we're just going to say that the status for this one is processed. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Look at, so, <laughs> so Ash, who is the maintainer of Benthos, he's joined the stream and he is going to, uh, he's going to backseat drive all of my blob lang writing, um, which is great. I love it. Thanks for joining the stream, dude. Ahmed, nice to see you too. Looks like we got some recommendations for bagels and smoked meat. Dude, bagels and smoked meat is like my thing. I'm actually stoked because next week I'm going to New York and yeah, live tech support. Nice, Maven here. Um, I'm going to New York. Uh, so if there is anybody who's in NYC, I'd love to kind of uh, see you next week maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, New York, like um, first of all, like delicatessen, one of my favorite types of like places to go, but also like Jewish appetizers. So basically, yeah, bagels, smoked meat, fish spread, like all of that stuff is literally to die for. It's the best. Um, so I'm excited. I'm excited to go to some Russ and Daughters, which if you've been to New York and you've been to Russ and Daughters, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, it's going to be a good time. So, okay, cool. Um, so we have our location, we have status processed. Um, it looks like, oh yeah, cause we have count of a hundred. I bet if we put negative one here, we'll get it indefinitely. Um, so, okay, cool. So we have some locations generated. We have the status process now. Um, you know, we have to go ahead and, oh, thank you. Yes, Ash, I would love some some more stickers because I think that you gave me a lot of stickers, but my kids like, <laughs> My kids use tech stickers everywhere. Like my, my, my five-year-old has like an Envoy sticker on her water bottle <laughs> and she takes that thing to school. And I'm like, what's this? Why, why does she have an Envoy sticker? Anyway, uh, so we now have the status. We have this, all the stuff that we're going to index. And now we can just put a bunch of like junk here. So we could probably just say like root toot or root, whichever one you want to do. Um, I'm just going to say like name and we'll just generate some sort of fake name here. Um, let's go uh, fake. I think it's just first underscore name and last underscore name. Uh, Ash, you're going to see how like rusty I am at, um, at, at blob laying and stuff um, because I just haven't, I haven't touched it in a very long time. But I actually love this, like for generating data and stuff, I just have this thing on a loop and, you know, I just kind of eyeball it and keep it on a watcher. And it's it's actually really fun. Um, like, obviously, there's some oh, index three out of range. That's because I only have three entries and, you know, zero indexes. This ain't no Lua. This is blob lang, baby. Um, OK, so cool. We have a fake first name. Um, I'm just going to say first name and last name. And I could even just say, you know, root dot customer is this. And I could just say, you know, yeah, not, not the most well-written, but um, we're getting there. Okay. So we have a customer first name and last name. We might even want to have their like address. Let's go. Now I'm just yellowing. Can I get a fake address? Nope. Um, what is it? I can get a fake Mac address. Uh, we got title. We have blah, blah, blah. We have a phone number, so that, that might be just good enough to do. Um, yeah. Oh, toll free, toll free phone number? Of course. Okay, let's do that. Let's go for that. All right. Uh, for those of you who just joined us, what we're doing is we're just generating some data that we're going to throw into a stream. And then um, I'm going to be using this data in a future video. We'll, we'll actually put all the examples together as well, and we'll do some drawing. Um, I'm faster at using Benthos docs than, than you are. Well, that, that's fun. Um, one of the things that I, I need to actually change is, uh, and I ran into this, is I, I, just, I just started using Arc as a browser, and I, I switched Command-T to Command-K. 
Because I'm like, oh, yeah, it'll be like Slack and it'll be like linear. And then I realized like all of the documentation sites use command K. I'm like, oh, no, no more keyboard. So actually, I'm just going to change that really quick. Um, keyboard shortcuts. Let's just new, new tab should just be command T like it, like it always is. OK, shouldn't mess with it. That's good. Now I can command K and I can say fake. OK, so. Um, we have a customer with an address. Um, we have an order with an ID. It has a location. It's been processed. Um, let's go ahead and, and use that um, hyphenated UUID for like a SKU. Um, oh, we do have UUID. We just have UUID v4. Uh, that, that works too. Let's just do that. And um, we'll also put, I'll just say created at. And uh, we'll say uh, now. I wonder what this formats into. Is it like ISO 25519 or something like that? Or is it, oh, it's, uh, yeah, okay, cool. So we have a status, we have a created at. We now want like maybe a SKU, like what, is, what was the thing that they ordered? And I don't really care about having these be real. Um, so we'll just use UID V4 here which is great. Um, and one other kind of neat trick that you could do, is, so we're, we're outputting to standard out right now, um, but you could also, I guess, uh, you can format this, can't you? That's in GCP BigQuery. Do, do, do. Is it pretty? I don't remember what it is, um, but th there's a way to kind of just output this. Maybe it's just using the JSON output or something like that. Um, but there's a way to output this with a JSON processor. Um, you could pretty print that JSON if you wanted to. Um, but I think this is good. So, I mean, I'm just gonna quit right here. I'll just grab one of these um, and we'll just, you know, throw this into, into JQ. And we have kind of a structure. I think this is good enough for now. And we could also, um, you know, we could also just massage it. Um, but it looks like we have kind of our first event, which would be around kind of processing uh, an order. And we'll shove a bunch of other kind of events in there that has kind of the same structure, but just a different status um, and likely a different timestamp. Um, that way we can, uh, we can do a lot of really neat things with this, like reporting and um, junk like that. Uh, okay, we have some questions in the chat. On Twitch, uh, I want to offer. I uh, don't know. No, no, this is just some some bot. Um, root is ah, it's the format JSON. You're totally right. Yes, thank you very much, sir. I know I'm a little bit behind, so um, let's go. Let's try that. Whoops. There we go. Now it's outputting formatted JSON for each of these, which is sweet. Hey, what's going on? Thanks for joining on YouTube. Uh, feel free to ask any questions that you have um, about Nats, about Benthos. Um, you know, for those of us who just joined, we're doing some data processing with Nats and Benthos, and we're going to take all this data that we're generating here, we're just going to shove it into a Nats stream, and then we're going to build a bunch of kind of Nats consumers so we can see all kinds of different ways that we can kind of slice and dice this data with one stream, um, but multiple kind of consumers all running at the same time. All right, this looks good to me. Let's go ahead and put it into a Nats stream. Once again, I forgot how we do this, um, but let's go ahead and go Nats jet stream. So we have a Nats jet stream output and we can just connect all of the things here. Um, we have a connection name, which is great. Um, we create a connection URL. Let's go to advance. We have some URLs for the Nats server, which that will be um, that will be connecting to uh, Zenity Cloud or NGS. Uh, we have the subjects that we want to output on, and we can use some bloblang uh, interpolation um, to kind of create this subject dynamically. And then uh, there's some metadata. We don't really care about that. Um, we want we, we don't need to use MTLS. We will use auth, and we have a user creds file in our directory here that we'll use. Um, 
Ooh, inject tracing map. Somebody added tracing to Nats. That's cool. We're also going to be adding some more official tracing support for Nats as well. Um, and and alongside that, we're going to be adding some middleware. So I think there's going to be some uh, some you know cool things coming down the pipe for that. Um, real quick, I'm going to check in on Twitter to see if anybody asks questions because I don't think they they come up here. So let's just go over to um, let's go over to Twitter and or X and see what's going on. Oh, seven notifications. Oh, just some people saying, um, join the stream. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. Back over to Benthos. Oh, I think I had a tab open here somewhere. Did I change it? Nah, it's just stream. Okay. So we'll add the auth with the, uh, with the user creds file. We'll add the URLs and we'll add the subject stuff. So uh, let's go ahead and test this out. Oh my goodness. Um, output, we'll give this a label of, um, you know, Jetstream Publisher. Actually, before we do that, let's just get this working with regular NATs and then we'll use Jetstream here. Um, I think that'll be a little bit easier. So the cool thing is that these look very much the same, like they use the same authentication scheme and URLs and stuff. So you can get it kind of working in NATs before you shove it all into a stream. And that's just a, a little bit better, a little bit easier to debug and um, get right before you start shoving things into a stream and 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 you know getting pub acts and stuff like that all going. So. We'll say the label is our pub. We'll just say Nats Publisher or Event Publisher, and we'll say uh, Nats. Our URLs will be connect connect.ngs.global. We will have some auth in the mix here where we will have a user creds, user creds, user credentials file, uh, user.creds, which I believe, yeah, we are running Benthos from the root, user creds is right there. And we're not gonna do tracing, we'll keep max and flight by default, so we need a subject, um, let's just try with some funky subject before we do some interpolation. Uh, hello worlds. And the thing that you'll notice is once we run this, um, we're no longer going to be getting, well, never mind, we are getting output. Um, let's see what happened. Um, config lint error field output is invalid when component type is generate input um oh did i burp yaml <laughs> indentation baby um i should have started with something like q i swear um okay fail to connect to nats no servers available for connection sweet um i think i need like i don't know do i need this Ooh, I really, I really did it now. Okay. Um, no servers available for connection. Uh, what did I do here? I think we should have connect.ngs.global available to us. I mean, we should. I have it right here. So let's go ahead and... Um, that's context info. I guess do we need TLS here? Maybe, just maybe. Ah, I'm dumb. It's URLs. I'm a dumbo. I'm a dumb dumb, everybody. This is the cool part about going on stream is you get to see me be a dumb dumb. Whereas if you just watch my videos, you'll be like, wow, that guy really knows what he's doing. It turns out I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, okay, cool. 
So what I was going to say is now that we have an output in Benthos, um, it's no longer going to be like printing to standard out. That's because the default output when you put nothing in there is standard out. Um, I could obviously like, you know, the, split this off and say like, yeah, go to go to Nats and also go to standard out. Or I could even say like, go log this thing if I wanted to. Uh, but I'm not going to do any of that. I'm not going to do any of it. In fact, I'm just going to subscribe to hello dot greater than. And now we have our data in here. So, um, whoops. Now we have our data in here. So we're getting messages. It's JSON up, which is great. Um, it is formatted JSON, uh, which is even better, I guess. Um, we probably don't want to format that JSON. But uh, now, now you guys can kind of see, like we're sending data over to Nats. Um, we didn't have to write an application for it. We're just generating it all with Benthos, which is sweet. It's pretty cool. Um, let's hook this up to Jetstream. Well, actually, before we do that, let's actually go use some interpolation to craft the subject that we need. So I'm going to look over here and start doing some interpolations. Um, the way we want to do this is, oh, that's cool. You could use JSON functions there. Um, that's nice. Okay, so we want to do this interpolation stuff and because we don't want to use environment variables, we need this little like bang so we can actually call blobbling in here. And then um, I think we could just start calling stuff on the root um, or maybe we have to do content or maybe we have to do JSON. Um, I guess since we're formatting JSON, we might have to do that. But uh, let's go ahead and wrap this sucker like that. Put a bang. And now we can start uh, doing something. So I'm going to say orders dot. What did we say? We said orders dot location dot ID dot status. So let's. Um, Let's see how we how wrong we can get this the first time. So we'll say, um, can I just say like, not, it's not root. It's, uh, I think I could just reference it, right? I could just say, uh, I'm just gonna say ID. Does that work? And that's for the orders.id. Now I need to pass something. I'm not reading stuff the right way message for my ID do, 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 do. JSON doc dot created at, Oh, I can kind of do something like that, I guess. Um, I, I thought there was an easier, I know that there's an easier way. I'm just not <clears throat> quite getting to it yet. Um, it's not settling down in my brain. Um, burr, 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 walk through. It's this, this is what I was thinking about. Um, let's try this dot ID. Does that work? No, no. Oh, it probably is working. I was just, uh, once again, being a dumb dumb. Okay. Orders. Yep. Okay. So we got our ID there. Um, let's just subscribe to orders here. We'll comment out this JSON format. Here we go. Perfecto. Okay, so we have uh, orders and the ID. Now let's kind of make this look the way we want it to in terms of orders, location, ID, status. Here we go. I don't even think I need this in here. I could just say location, location, ID, and status. Let's try it. Boom. Okay, so we have orders.us.id.processed. Orders.eu.id.processed. Great. So this is all coming in at half a second. Uh, we can obviously shove a lot more data in there a lot faster. Um, but I think we're, we're good to go in terms of how we want the subject to look. We have our data 
looking the way that we want to, now we could just start putting this into a Nats jet stream. And we have our subject here. Um, it's going to say fail to send message because we don't have a jet stream that's actually taking this. And so let's actually go ahead and create that jet stream in Synadia Cloud. If I have it up somewhere. Um, okay, we're in Synadia Cloud. We want to go ahead and create a stream. I'm going to call this orders. I'm going to say um, full life cycle of orders. And we want file storage. Oh, uh, thanks. Thanks for saying you're enjoying the stream. Um, uh, I, I realize I'm not showing stuff correctly. Um, yeah, I'm glad that you're liking the stream. Uh, obviously, this is, you know, how I, I'm just kind of showcasing how I work. <laughs> And it's a lot of bumbling around for the most part, but um, hopefully it's a it's a fun watch. Uh, all right, so we want orders dot greater than. Um, so we're going to shove all of that data into that order stream. And if we hit save, um, if Benthos didn't already kind of time out, we might start getting data here. Let's see, um, that's extreme list. Boop. No, that's not what I wanted. Give me a bigger screen. No, it doesn't want to do that. Um, we have jobs, we have jobs, DLQ. Did we create the, it in the right place? No, we did not. Let's go to rethink connectivity. Okay, sorry, went to the wrong place. Let's do that orders again. Orders, and we'll add, I was using the wrong account. Here we go. Orders, orders dot greater than, and hopefully we should start seeing data. Let's just restart this. All right, Benthos is not complaining, which means that uh, um, info, let's look at that stream, go to orders, and we have 21 subjects, we have 25 messages in there. Um, great, perfect, perfecto. We got it, guys. Um, okay, so let's actually crank this up, and instead of 500 milliseconds, let's just like, uh, we could either run this for a while, or we can say, um, Let's just shove a bunch in here. Let's just do like 10,000 in here. And let's check out Synadia Cloud. We'll look at this stream. Great, it has 10,084 messages. Um, this is enough to start playing with in some way, shape, or form. But before we do that, let's actually go ahead and um, Let's add more statuses in here. Now, the fun part about all of this is we just generated a bunch of data with like random IDs. And those random IDs are, um, well, they're random. So if we went, if we wanted to create more statuses like, you know, shipped or canceled or whatever, we're going to have to, um, well, we're going to have to read that data from Jetstream. We're going to have to decide, do we want it to be shipped or canceled or whatever? And then we have to go emit another event into that Nats Jetstream. Um, and this is, again, once again, where Benthos kind of comes in and we get to have a lot of fun with it. So let's actually create a new Benthos um, config file. We'll leave this one alone and we'll um, create another one called, um, I'll just say like processing.yaml. I don't even know what to call these things, but, um, and instead of the generate input, what we're actually going to do is we're going to start reading, um, input from Nats. So we'll say, um, we'll give this a label of like, uh, um, orders, order processing. And we'll say, I'll just gonna, we'll call this orders. And we'll say that Nats Jetstream is the input. And this is actually going to create a consumer under the hood. Um, by, by default, it's going to create uh, what we call an ephemeral consumer, which is just one that like fires up and you whip through all the data and do whatever you want with it. And then when you're done with it, Nats server will clean it up, which is like really cool. And, and we're actually going to dive into some like really um, good use cases for that once we get all this data into the stream. Okay, feel free to ask any questions about Nats. We'd love to answer them. Um, let's copy. I know there is a way um, to kind of like 
copy some of this stuff over in templates. I swear, Ash, if you're still watching this, I'm like, I should have just started with Q because I, I am in love with Q and it makes stuff like templating and pulling in like, you know, reusable structure so much better. But for now, we'll just uh, copy and paste. So we will go over here. Um, we got our URLs and we got our auth. Uh, we just need to tweak, not the subject that we want to pull in, but we're going to be referencing the stream, I believe. So let's go back over to Benthos and um, burr, 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 burr. where are you? Yeah, we'll go over here and we will look up uh, the Nats Jetstream input so we can read from a Nats Jetstream. And this takes a URL. It takes a queue if you need to, and then it takes a subject. Oh, it does take a subject, okay. So we can do like a filter and stuff like that. And it takes a stream, and then optionally a durable in case you want this to be like a durable consumer. Um, and then bind, I don't know what bind does here. What does bind do? Indicates the subscription should use an existing consumer. Okay. I might need to refactor this at some point. We did a, um, we, we did a really big update to the Nats Jetstream like client API and it's like a lot more easy to reason about. So I think soon here, we'll have to take a look at this Nats Jetstream um, Benthos client and maybe figure out if we can do another iteration of it. Um, it does have a deliver flag. There's like so much more cool stuff that you could do. Yeah, ACK wait, ACK, uh, max ACK pending. There's also so many cool configuration options and consumers. And this is what we're going to, once we get all the data in here, this is what we're going to cover today, probably for the last you know couple hours of the stream. Um, unless anybody has cool questions and I'll go off into a rabbit hole there. Um, so, and by the way, I have this cool, um, just as an aside, before we jump back in here, um, one, of the, one of the things I wanted to test with this stream was like, hey, does multi-stream work? And I, I think the answer is yes, because, um, you know, it's not like I stream all that much, but like, I, you know, 25 people watching the stream is, um, you know, a, a decent amount. And I think that's because of the multi-stream. At least, at least that's what I'm seeing on, on my end. Um, so th that's cool. The other kind of neat thing that I am trying out alongside multi-stream and this whole new setup is... Um, is this idea of drawing. And so, you know, if you've seen any of my videos on the Synedia YouTube channel, you know that I like to use Excaladraw a lot. And I wanted to find a way to like put that into, um, you know, into like a stream and find a way to kind of make it, you know, uh, feel a little bit more dynamic and stuff like that. So check this, check this out. Um, if I go to uh, my drawing and Excalibur. You're going to see a green screen here, but check this out. And you know, I'll use some movie magic um, in, in the more edited workflow. But now you have me in the background over here. Woo! I'm all blurred out. Um, but kind of like a frosted glass look. I can start diagramming some stuff. Um, and so just to even explain, like, okay, let's talk about Benthos for a minute. You know, Benthos is a data pipeline tool, right? I swear, Ash is going to roll over in his grave when he hears me like describe Benthos. <laughs> this is why I got to get him on like a podcast sometime and we could uh, we could chat more about it and not have me try to explain Benthos. So you have your input and this could be like, again, really anything. In this case, we're, we're, we're generating input. We are. Um, we're generating input. We are. We are also getting input from NATS in some cases, um, but you can get input from anywhere. If you, like, if you're trying to migrate from like, I don't know, like AWS, like Kinesis, or maybe you're like coming over from Redis, or maybe you know you're just you're just wanting to use NATS and stuff, but you want freaking HTTP. This is where. Um, this is where Benthos comes really in handy because all the stuff here can be used as like an input to your pipeline. And then in terms of, you know, your actual, your second layer, this is where you have kind of like your processing steps. Okay, let's group these here. Um, and your processing steps are, you know, really just 
parts of your pipeline that you want to start transforming your data into. Um, in, in our case, you know, we used a mapping inside of our um, inside of our input, but you can kind of do you know the same thing with, with anything. You could say uh, you know maybe this thing starts out as a uh, maybe it starts out as I don't know like an HTTP post body HTTP form. And then we want to take that and we want to transform it into like uh, a JSON. And we want to like pull some junk out of that. Or yeah, maybe we just want to parse it. We want to pull some like junk out of it and like, you know, uh, what do we want to do? You know, we want to like get um, some sort of fields out of here. And then we want to go call like a, a service so we can like enrich that data. And then we want to format that as JSON. And then we want to send it over to, you know, the output, which would be like NATS. Boop. Um, anyway, so this is a this is a kind of a cool example where, you know, you can you can really do all kinds of cool things. And this is why I think um, Benthos is such a good fit for stuff like NATS. Oh my gosh, try and draw a blobfish. Yeah, no freaking way, dude. Um, let's see, Benthos. Oh my gosh, there's so many good blobfish. By the way, Ash, did you draw this blobfish? And or are you the author of all the blobfishes? Cause it's pretty impressive. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a drawer. Not really one of a draw I, I don't really consider myself a drawer, but this is pretty cool stuff. I honestly I wish I had a mascot like this. This would be pretty sweet. Um so yeah, you could just blobfish all this stuff. This is why Benthos is cool. Um and uh and it's such a great fit for NATS because NATS is really good at like shuffling data around. It's really good at storing data anywhere that you want. Um, but one of the things that NATS doesn't like try to solve for is like, how do you transform that data? Um, and how do you like, you know, we do have bridges for, for certain things, but I think Benthos does a really good job of like, Hey, if you're migrating from one platform to another, you could just like, you know, use, um, Benthos to do that instead of try to write your own code. Like there's, there's an unbelievable amount of, you know, customers and users that I've come across who have just like written a bunch of little applications to like do these little types of things. And, um, I usually just tell people like, go use Benthos. Um, very cool. The chef, the Viking. I, I love it. I love it. Um, this or the gopher mascot. Yeah. Yeah. The gopher mascot's really dope. Um, okay. Uh, back to some questions. Um, K Bray asks, uh, last time I was playing with NATS, the big thing that was coming was the concept of services. Can you speak to the state of that currently? Yeah, so the the NATS services API is still uh, still there, and we have people using it. Um, I even saw somebody on Twitter the other day who was uh, running like this crazy AI, you know, cluster, uh, you know, of, of a bunch of like, uh, are, were they Raspberry Pis? I think they were Raspberry Pis. Um, and, uh, and probably some other like AI chips. Like I have three Jetson nanos, um, just sitting there ready to be used. I realize you can't see my face right now. Um, three Jetson nanos just like ready to be used. And he was, um, he was using that, you know, to save a bunch of money by not like running all that stuff in the cloud. Um, which is actually a really good idea for AI because like AI hardware right now in the cloud is like absurdly expensive. Like it's just much, much better to like even buy a little like Jetson Nano or I have an Aura Nano that was like 500 bucks. And, um, and I'll have to do a stream on this one day, but I was running, um, for those of you who are familiar with like image recognition and stuff, I was running a uh, YOLO V4, um, which is a, a AI image detection algorithm that's, you know, look it up real quick. Um, it's a, it's an AI detection algorithm that, uh, stands for you only look once, which means it just does one pass through over the image, um, to, uh, to do the object detection. And it's, so it's really fast, but the interesting thing about all this and why like the commoditization of AI hardware is, is so important is because, um, is, is truly because like I can run this on, I can run this algorithm on a Mac studio and I'm getting like half a frame a second. And then I go like run a, run it on a $500 or a nano, it's running at 60 frames a second. And that's just like, you know, you get so many advantages for running on dedicated AI hardware. And again, because AI is all the hotness right now, it's absurdly expensive um, to even to run stuff like inference. Um, 
obviously like if you want to like pull in a bunch of like hefty GPUs and stuff like that, like for training, it's still, you know, um, it's still feasible to do that in the cloud. But I think for, for inference, like uh, AI detection algorithm of sorts, object detection, stuff like that, you, you just buy a little piece of hardware and do that stuff at the edge. Um, anyway, like, Somebody's doing cool stuff like that um, with Nats, and they're using the service uh, API to kind of drive all of that. So, um, yeah, it's still in a great state. People are using it. I encourage you to use it. Um, it's really, you know, really easy to get started with it. Um, Nats service API, and um, you'll have a good time. Um, we're going to be continuing to like. We're going to continue to be making it even better. Uh, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning of the stream is we're looking right now at implementing kind of a middleware framework. Um, and for those of you who, who don't, probably not none of you know, but uh, back in the day, I, uh, I wrote a lot of Golang kind of um, libraries, Martini, Negroni, stuff like that, that did all like sorts of HTTP middleware. Um, but yeah, we're, we're looking at building a little middleware stack for all the client libraries. So being able to like implement stuff like hotel tracing, um, and, you know, logging and schema validation and all that stuff it can be driven through middleware. Um, that way you can have a lot going on in your client without having to like write a lot of code. Um, my other kind of goal with this, by the way, is that like all of that stuff can go back into Benthos. And so, you know, we'll utilize the services API a bit more heavily there in Benthos. I, I'm, I intend to contribute that kind of stuff. Um, so it'll be really, really neat to, to dive in and play with that and also have support on the Benthos side. Um, let's see what else we got. What else we got? Um, I'm going to have to learn Benthos after a stream as it solves the need of mine when learning Nats. Yeah, it's a, it's a super cool thing to pair with Nats. Um, I, I think it's a, again, match made in heaven. I'm a big fan, big, big fan. Back to the code. Um, so we have our orders, that stuff's going into a stream and now we need to process it. Cool, so um, let's go ahead and add the stream that we want and the subjects that we want. Uh, oh, it's optional. Um, let's just, can we just put a stream in there and have it work? Stream orders, no filters. And let's go ahead and get rid of that benthos and try this benthos. Um, we'll say processing.yaml. Subject is empty. We need subject. So we'll just say uh, order is stuck right then. Burp, 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 burp. Wrap this here because YAML. Or do I have to escape it? I don't know. Goodness gracious. Um, what is it complaining about? Oh, uh, no, I'm a Dumbo. I don't know how to type. Uh, subject. There we go. Will this break on me? Nope. Here we go. So now we're reading all the data. We just read all the data, all 10,000 of it. So yeah, this is another cool thing that you can do in Benthos. And so if I wanted to, for instance, do a processor that would change everybody's name to Blobfish, I could totally do that. Um, let's actually do that right now. Um, burr, burr, burr. I always forget the... I forget how processors work. Components. About here we go. Pipeline processors. Pipeline processors. So you can have multiple processors in Benthos, which is great. And it's a list of things. And I want to just do a mapping real quick. And what I want to do is I want to say um, root dot blob raid. Yeah. Oh man. Actually, I don't even have Twitch open, so I, I have no idea if, like, if I was rated for whatever reason. I guess I'd see it in the viewership, but I wouldn't know because I'm I'm using Restream for a lot of this. Viva Benthos, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so I can even say root dot customer dot name equals blobfish, and that's gonna read it back to me. Yep, uh, but. It also, uh, do I have to say? Uh, 
there we go. So we got all the original data now, except everybody's, uh, oh, everybody has a, a name field of blobfish, but I have first name and last name. So everybody's first name is going to be blobfish. There we go. So first name is blobfish, last name is Marina. We could probably come up with some really cool combos here. Um, yeah, sweet. Uh, blobfish Reagan. Um, maybe we need to start doing the last name as Blobfish. Okay, what do we got? We have Mechie Blobfish. We have Oda Blobfish. We have um, of all kinds. Diamond? Diamond Blobfish. Yeah, nice. Okay, so... So we're going to use Benthos to not rename everybody Blobfish, but what we will do is um, we'll actually create, um, we'll take these, we'll kind of clone the data, but we'll update the timestamp, we'll update the status, and then we'll just put it back into the stream. Um, and so for this one, let's assume for a second that, um, back to our uh, readme for a minute, we have all these states. We started with pending. Let's assume everything passed validation. Um, so what we actually want to do is output validation uh, records for every single one of these things that went into the pending state. Um, and we probably also want to output confirmed. And I'm probably just going to do like a very lazy job of this and not be a software engineer for a second and just copy paste. Um, we could also just go straight to processing as well. So um, let, let's go ahead and do some of that. Um, so instead of doing orders.star, I actually want to filter on orders. Uh, location is good, ID is good, but we also we just want all of the pending ones. Okay, so now we're pulling in all of the pending orders, um, which is none of them. I have to restart this. Nets uh, stream net sub stream orders. What did I do here? What have I done? Orders EU process. Oh, process is what I output. Whoops. Let's just do that. So I guess we can assume that we have a bunch of processed orders. Actually, I don't like that. <laughs> this is going to ruin my flow. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a Nats uh, stream um, purge orders just to delete all that data, delete all that stinking data, and we'll uh, we'll run through the seed one more time, but we'll uh, name rename process to pending, and we'll just generate a bunch more data, um, and we should be good to go. Let's go over and check on uh, Sunidia Cloud for a second. I have a bunch of Sunidia Clouds open. Here we go. Okay, so we have 10,000 messages in there again. Let's go ahead and um, go back to running our processing pipeline where we get pending and we'll rename, rename everybody to Blobfish. There we go, we have a bunch of pending status stuff. That's all working as expected. And we can now do stuff like, we'll change the status to, um, goodness, I need a better way to mock up these statuses, to validation. Oh, let's get rid of validation, let's just say confirmed. We'll say uh, we'll update the timestamp, but we'll keep all the data the same. So this might be, you know, uh, kind of like an order lifecycle stuff where maybe we're kind of like adding stuff on to the the data set as time goes on. But all these are going to exist as individual messages inside of the stream. Um, still duplicate first name and fake, no last name. Oh. And, you might be right there. Um, oh no, we have we have first name and last name. First name Michelle, last name Blobfish. So we should be we should be good in there, maybe. Anyways, we the cool part is we could just run all of these again um, if we if we did run into issues uh, like we just did. Okay, so 
Um, what we'll do here is I also, so we should get now 20,000 messages because we're going to say all of them were confirmed. None of them had any issues or anything like that. Uh, Benthos does have this concept of dropping though, which is pretty cool, um, which basically just tells us to like, yeah, just drop that message, don't do anything. Incoming raid, what? Mihai, don't, don't, uh, don't do that to me. Don't do that to me. Um, okay, so this is confirmed. We updated the timestamp, and so we should have 20,000 messages in there. I think after that, we should narrow, narrow them down a little bit and be a little bit more selective. Um, but let's go ahead and run. Oh, before we, uh, yeah, we'll just run through this and make sure it's, it's behaving as expected. We have confirmed, and we have a recent timestamp. Um, okay, cool. So then let's output that into Nat's Jetstream. Um, we could pretty much just copy um, what we had here. There we go. Um, the other cool thing about Benthos, for those who don't know, is that like we could run all of these configs together um, in like stream mode, um, so they could all be running simultaneously. Um, and and one thing that we could do is if we wanted to simulate kind of like a live data, we could modify that generate command that we were working on to you know go at an interval. I think you could even do something like a, pick a random interval or something like that. Um, and, and then that way, you know, you can kind of simulate some like live data stuff and then, you know, have your, have your, all of your p processing pipelines kind of work that way. Um, great. Uh, processing is probably a bad name for this. So I'm just going to rename this to confirmed. I'll get rid of my watcher. Let's also verify we should have 20,000 messages in the stream. So we have a bunch of created and then uh, later confirmed messages. And now we can kind of do a similar similar ish thing uh, with our status. We'll go into, we'll skip processing. We'll just say shipped, delivered, completed, canceled. Yep. So let's assume that a subset of this stuff gets shipped. Um, nope. Okay, here we go. Okay, so some of this stuff gets shipped, but only some. Let's, so let's look at uh, Benthos again. Uh, components, and we'll search for drop. Drops all messages. So we don't want that, but there's got to be a way to like, I don't know, uh, filter, filtering and sampling. Can we sample events, another type of filter, we want to sampling filter, we can do that with a random number generator. Drop 50% of, oh, this is exactly what I want. This is exactly what I want. Um, oh, that's cool. You could also do some deterministic stuff. So if we wanted to like rerun through this, we could, we could do that. Um, but yeah, no, we'll just, I think this is good enough. So we'll say uh, root is if random int is deleted. Okay, 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 okay. I'm assuming this goes at, at the end um, here. So under shipped, we'll just say that we'll mark all of these things as um, shipped. We'll update the timestamp, but we will select only 50% of them, or it's random, so um, it'll eventually be around 50%, but it won't be perfect perfect. Let's see how far off we, we end up being. Um, I'm just going to YOLO this and run it. Oh, I made a boo-boo. We didn't want pin pending, we wanted uh, confirmed. So here's the cool thing that we can do though. We can say, um, we can use nats to kind of delete all these messages. So I can say nats stream info orders. Oh, we'll kind of see the state of things here. So we have 25,000 messages. So yeah, 5,047, that's pretty, that's pretty even. Um, uh, we get from uh, Cuckoo. So far, Benthos seems a tad more powerful than Datadog's vector in the sense of Benthos uh, being more generic. Yeah, it's totally generic. And I'm using, obviously, I'm just using like the generate function and nats, but like 
it's so cool for bridging all the other stuff together. Uh, just a really, really great tool. Um, we have all these different subjects. And so I can actually do a Nats stream purge. to delete a bunch of subjects, I believe. Yep. Uh, the question is, can I do it on a wildcard? I have no idea. I've actually never done this. Let's, let's try it. We can say orders dot star dot star dot uh, shipped. My shell does not like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So we're back to 20,000. So we just did a, we just had an undo button. And part of that is because we have, you know, that, that shift status. So obviously like I ran bent those and I was like, Oh no, I fat fingered it and I didn't do it the way that I wanted to. So I just deleted all the shipped based ones. And that's one of the cool things about like, you can put all this stuff in a stream, but you have so much flexibility based off of subjects. And the reason being is that Nats indexes all of its messages based off of the subject. So pretty cool stuff. Okay, um, let me check my Slack to make sure the world isn't blowing up and that I need to fix stuff. Um, okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so let's go back here. Um, we wanna pull all of the confirmed ones and we wanna mark them as shipped, but then we only wanna select about half of them to ship out. The other ones actually, what we could do is we could yeah, let, let's do this. Let's do this. Because maybe some of these are digital products, so they never get shipped. But maybe we do have to update the status to something else. Um, which, what we could do, instead of deleting it, we could say, yeah, let me, let me look at the if statement for a second. Conditionals. Well, if expression. Do, 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 do. Ah, cool. Yeah, there we go. So, I could just say root root status equals um, if there we go. We're gonna do a fifty fifty. Boop boop. We'll get rid of this one. And we'll say um, and we have an else. Perfect. So we'll say uh, half of these will have a status of shipped. The other half will get a status of, uh, I don't know, canceled or, yeah, let's do that. So we should get 30,000 messages into the stream. Um, and that way we can go ahead and have half of them, half-ish of them be shipped, half-ish of them be canceled, and we could just run a little bit more interesting reporting on that one. Um, so we'll run this, and we'll check Synadia Cloud. 30,000 messages. Great, great, great. Um, and yeah, half of them should be shipped, half of them should be canceled. Um, the way we would know that is you could just say Nats um, stream, but Nats sub uh, stream orders. Let's look at the last few here. Boop. Okay, so we got shipped. We got shipped. We got shipped. We got a bunch of shipped ones, and we got some canceled ones. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Some shipped, some canceled. Um, this might be good enough to go off of from a like data point of view, but let's actually take let's take the shipped ones and let's let's actually complete delivery. We'll take complete it out. We'll just say delivered. We'll we'll deliver. Whoa! I don't know what that did. Oh, I see what that did. Pasted. Yeah, we'll still say that some maybe are in like process of shipping, um, and we'll, we'll deliver like 
I don't know, 30% of them or something like that. Um, so we'll actually copy this and we'll say, um, call this delivery. Right. We'll say a delivery dot YAML. And we want to only look at the shipped ones. And we want to say, um, let's do that. And we'll say, um, else, can I do that? Or do I, do I drop or do I delete? Uh, let's see, I think deleted. What does deleted do? Function that returns the result in case the mapping target should be deleted, deleting. Okay, so that's, uh, oh, same thing. Okay, let's see if this runs. So we'll call this delivery. Look at our stream get updated. Oh, we got a null there. Um, because I think I deleted the status and not dropped the message. Um, but yeah, let's let's go ahead and what we'll do is we'll just fix this up by purging this. So net stream purge. Yeah, I know I'm yellowing this, but part of this is just so I can get the data that I need to for um, for this video. Okay, now we have 31,000 subjects. Um, let's see what this last bit. So we have some of these that are that have been delivered. Great. Okay, I think we have what we need. We use Benthos kind of just as a tool to insert a bunch of records, which is great. Um, thanks all you blobfish for telling me how to uh, how to do benthos right. Um, now we can kind of look into, uh, oh no, I saved it and I just output a bunch more stuff. So let's go ahead and um, we'll just delete this. You know what, here's what I'll do. Um, we'll get rid of null. Yes, and we'll get rid of shipped. Nope, delivered. Yes. Okay, we're back to 30,000, and then I will run this one more time, and I'll close Benthos out and never open it again. And, uh, I think we have to purge the null ones again because I wrote this bad. Okay, we're back. All right, so we have a stream that has... Um, a bunch of stuff in various states. The cool part is we are persisting kind of the, um, you know, we're persisting the the order ID essentially across all of these. Um, and so we can actually do some cool stuff like um, Nat's sub, uh, let's go ahead and go to stream orders. Yeah, I will find it in my sleep. That's a good point, Jeff. That's a good point, Ash. Ash Jeff's, Jeff. Nice one, Chef. Okay. Um, let's take this ID, for example, this one has been delivered. We can do some cool stuff in Nats, like, uh, Nats sub stream orders. Let's just go ahead and say, uh, orders dot star location dot that dot star. No matches for wild cards. Oh, that's in fish because my shell, here we go. So this is going to essentially give us life cycle for, um, for this entire uh, order. 
So we see that we, um, and this is going to play in the order that, you know, all of these things came in. So we see that it was pending at this stage and then it was confirmed and then it was shipped and then it was delivered. And that's for that one order. And so today what we're going to do um, now that we have all that data in place is we're actually just going to write some Jetstream consumers that can like look at this data in various ways. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Looks like I'm still online for everything. Okay, so I'm gonna start with some drawing um, because I also, for this video I want to, for, for this new video that I'm preparing for, um, I, I want to do some diagrams. And so I think we might just play with them here. And folks in the stream are free to ask questions about this because I also wanna know if some of this is coming across well. So I'm gonna go back over to um, my drawing in Excaladraw, woo! Um, uh, we'll go to frosted glass mode. Um, we'll go ahead and clear all this stuff out and we'll start fresh. Sorry. Sorry, blobfish. Um, okay. So again, one of the neat things about Jetstream and why I think it's just head over heels better than a lot of the alternatives in this space is mainly because you have this kind of CQRS style separation of the how this data is being written and then how it's accessed after it's written. So let me tell you what let me show you what I mean by that. So let's assume here that uh, this thing over here is a stream stream A. Let's call this stream A. And you have these messages in stream A. Let's just call this, uh, yeah, let's stretch this out a little bit. And we'll bump this text down a little bit as well. Uh, I don't like the way that looks. Okay, so let's just say we have an orders stream and it says orders dot um, US dot one, two, three dot uh, pending just like we were doing before. Okay. And then we have this same thing going on for all of these. Okay. Um, except this is going to be, you know, four, five, six, this is going to be one, two, three, but it's been, um, you know, confirmed. Let's say, then one, two, three has been shipped. Four, five, six has been confirmed. And then one, two, three has been delivered. So this is kind of like the structure of what the data looks like, right? Feels like kind of a, a transaction log or, um, you know, an append only log or you know, something like that, some, some sort of kind of, you know, uh, record of sorts, um, a ledger, if you will. Uh, and so this is the cool part is like this stream. And we talked about this in another video, like we could do all kinds of cool stuff with this stream where we can like split these streams off into, you know, different ones where, uh, I, I didn't do the EU part, but let's say order four, five, six was from the EU as an example, or from Canada. Um, that's not right. Four, five, six. We'll say Canada because we have Canadians in here. Um, so really here we have two orders from two different regions or locations and various different statuses from them. Um, and there's tons of different ways to roll up this data. There's tons of ways that data can be related to one another, but we're going to lean really heavily on um, this idea of uh, subject-based addressing to really kind of help define how this stuff uh, works in practice. And so we have stream A, and like I said, you can split all these streams off to where it's like, if you want data sovereignty for some reason, you can create you know stream B and C and you split them off. Um, and you have a lot of control over like what gets ingested and why, um, which is cool, but that's not what we're gonna cover today. What we're actually gonna cover today is we're gonna talk about how the superpower of NAT is that 
we can then just create all these consumers that like look at the data in a very, very different way. Um, so I'm going to say we have consumer A, consumer B, and consumer C. Do, do, do. And these consumers, not only is it just like, it's easy to think that maybe we're, oh, you're just filtering like, you know, filtering what data they're looking at. And in a way you kind of are, but it gets a bit more subtle than that because you can express a lot of kind of crazy use cases around this. And so let's, um, let's look at some of these use cases. So let's look at the case where maybe you're writing a service, um, Let's go back to our code view over here. Let's say that you have an order fulfillment service. So what are some of the attributes that you might want for fulfilling an order? Well, you're probably going to want a stream that's durable, meaning I want, a pro pro I want Nats to kind of keep track of, you know, this. I want Nats to kind of keep track of where I'm at in the stream at all times, even when my service goes offline and comes back online. I want to be able to kind of scale horizontally. Um, and so, you know, you want you want a, essentially a durable consumer here because you want, you know, somebody to kind of keep track of where you're at in the process. Um, and so, so that's one way that we could do that. So back over here, let's say that consumer A is doing, you know, I don't know, payment processing. So some of the attributes of this is that we want to be durable. We want to uh, filter. We want to filter on, um, you know, orders dot star dot star dot pending because maybe we're, we're still accepting payment here, right? Confirmed could be like, yeah, the payments processed. Um, and what else do we want here? We want um, we want to make sure that we acknowledge this, and um, maybe it's important that like we we process these things in order. So we want this to um, we we want an explicit acknowledgement model. We want um, strict ordering, and we want you know horizontal scalability. Now with payment processing, maybe strict ordering isn't like as important. That's like a, that's like an event sourcing kind of thing. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll save that one for later, but you can see that like this use case has things that it needs in order to actually be like a successful part of a distributed system. Right. Um, and so that, that's, that's one thing, right. But what about other stuff that might be interested in this data, you know, in, in other systems, you might have to just like store this data differently or like um, put it into a different topic or a different thing um, in the way that it needs to be. You have to kind of like massage your data to get it to the right place, but not with Jetstream. Um, if we wanted to do a different kind of use case, but with the same set of data, let's say like reporting, maybe we have like a front end where we're looking at this data and we want to be able to report on it very, very easily. We want to look at this data. Well, it's going to look very different in terms of its attributes, right? Instead of durable, we can actually go for ephemeral here because, you know, reporting is often, um, is often kind of on the fly, right? Um, so it's okay if we like take that, um, particular consumer and like throw it away when we're done with it. Um, you know, we, we might not want to filter on a subject, but instead we might want to, um, like have a particular, um, start time that we want to start at, right? Or start date. Um, and then uh, let's see. The other thing is uh, instead of like a acknowledging, you know, messages one by one, it's very possible that we could like batch acknowledge these. Meaning like, we'll just grab a bunch of them, get a bunch of them delivered to us. And then we'll like say, oh, yep, we're good. We got all the stuff. And then we could do whatever kind of like derivations or calculations we want on that. Um, and we don't really need horizontal scalability here. So like we could just get rid of that. 
Um, but like that, that makes for a good like reporting thing. And what I mean by this is like, what I mean by reporting is maybe you want to be able to say like, you know, uh, how many, how many orders in the EU or in Canada or answering like, you know, how many things have been shipped in the past three weeks, like just questions like that. Um, and so you can see like, this is the same data, but like very different things that it's trying to do. Right. Um, uh, we can, we can do event sourcing. We could do, uh, this is another kind of interesting one is like, uh, what, what about just a lookup? I kind of demonstrated this earlier today, but like, what if we want to do a, uh, just a simple lookup where maybe we know the ID of the thing that we want to look at and we want to just see its full life cycle. Right. So here, um, this is going to be ephemeral and it's going to give us, um, we don't need a start time, but we do want to filter on a particular order. So we can say orders dot star dot star dot, you know, uh, let's see, oh, we have orders dot star dot, you know, ID one, two, three dot star. So it's like, give me all the statuses of this particular order. So I can know, you know, what it's, you know, what its current status is. Um, but I could also know what all of its previous statuses are. Um, the other cool thing about a lookup is, uh, I could also potentially say, give me the, you know, last by subject. Maybe we could put that in a different use case as well. Um, so that that's kind of like an optional thing that we could do as well. So it's like, maybe I just want to know like what, what state is this particular uh, piece of data in? Um, you know, has it been shipped or has it been delivered? Uh, maybe I just want to look up its status and I can actually do that very, very simply by putting a filter, you know, using that consumer to be able to get that last subject. Nats also has some built-in mechanisms around this, especially with KV where it's like you can get that direct get. Um, and I can dive into that a little bit more, but like uh, ho hopefully this like makes sense in terms of like, we have these multiple use cases and we have a single kind of source of truth data. And um, what a lot of these other technologies like fail to do is give you so much power over how to access that data. Um, typically you'll have to use like a stream processing solution or, you know, uh, plugins or add-ons, or you have to, you know, God forbid, write your own code <laughs> to, um, to have to kind of like get the data the way you want. So you could even start any sort of like derivation of it. Um, and so, okay, here's another cool one. Um, I'll do, I'll do like two more, two more use cases. And then I think we'll, we'll write some code. We'll do this and this. All right. Sure. I'll just pull this guy down. Okay. So consumer C let's say that consumer C is doing a simulation or a replay. Have you guys ever used something like, um, gosh, what is it called? There's like a, there was a product that was kind of creepy, but kind of cool. It came out a while ago. Um, full story where like you could see people's like visits to the website and you could see them kind of click around. And I know there's tons of like, there's tons of click tracking and stuff like that. But imagine that like, instead of, um, instead of us processing like, orders in some sort of commerce sort of way, we were actually exploring, you know, um, click tracking or interactions on a website where it's like they clicked this div and then they clicked that div and then they, you know, hit back in their browser. Um, then they typed on their keyboard, whatever. Um, the simulation and replay is actually really cool because, uh, Nats also gives you some flexibility for that. So, um, Nats gives you kind of a replay policy. Maybe you want to filter on like, you know, some sort of client ID, right? Let's just say that. Um, and you also want to like change the replay policy. You can do that with Nats consumers. You can say, I want the replay policy by default. It's instant. Meaning it's like going to just deliver all the message to you, messages to you as fast as you can get them. But you can also just say like, I want, um, original which makes uh, all of the timings between when all of these events occur actually get replayed to this consumer in real time. 
um, which is super cool because imagine that you're doing this on something like a front end and you just spin up a consumer that's ephemeral right there and just start replaying all of these events in real time. Um, so, so that's another kind of like same set of data, different use case. Um, what other cool things that can we do here? Uh, let's do counting. I know this is another simpler one, but kind of similar to reporting in that use case. Um, oops. Similar enough to reporting, but maybe we want to, um, Maybe we want to get all of the orders, right, in the EU. And we want to see this, the last status of all of them. And so we can actually say, you know, give me the um, last. We will actually use last by subject explicitly here. So in this case, it will actually just deliver to us um, this one and this one in this order. So it'll tell us that that uh, order four, five, six has been confirmed, and order one, two, three has been delivered. If we do last by subject that way, um, and so we could we could like filter in very many different ways to do some like really cool counting. We can count on status. We can count on um, ID. We can count on uh, location. And so, and you can, again, mix and match these in certain ways to where you, again, you could do like very, very cool reporting style stuff. Um, goodness, there's, there's so many other cool things, um, in terms of like settings that you can utilize. We have this headers only. And so maybe in a reporting context, like we don't care about the payloads. We, whoops, we don't care about the payloads. We really only care about the, the subjects in there because we're doing some counting or whatever. Um, there's there's all kinds of really really neat stuff um, that we could that we could do here. So that's just a high level description of like okay yeah yeah I get it now. Nats their consumers are super super flexible. So let's actually dive into the code and write some of these use cases. I'm going to start with um, kind of a maybe a payment processing one because this one seems like the most um, close to home. Like it's what people use queues for in general is they they want you know to do the like typical queue uh, behavior. They want durability. They want to be able to process things and maybe have an order to them or you know horizontally scale out. And they want an explicit acknowledgement model. So let's go ahead and, and build that. All righty. So over in Kitty, in NeoVim, let's go ahead and fire up some Go. We've connected. We've created a new Jetstream context, and now we are going to uh, create a, I'm just going to call this one, uh, yeah, the order stream, and we're going to create a new consumer here. Okay, so we have so many options for what makes a consumer, so I'm just going to call this one payment processor. And remember, we shoved all, whoops. I just realized that you guys can't see my screen. Sorry about that. Let's go back. Okay, cool. So uh, so now you can see my screen. So we, we have a consumer here called Payment Processor. And uh, we do want to make this durable. So we'll just give this you know some durability. We'll call the durable name Payment Processor. And we'll give this a description of uh, processes. Um, processes pending orders. And um, what do we call this? Confirmed? Yeah. And confirms them. Right? And we're not going to do any of the logic here because we already did that in Benthos. But just as an example of like what it looks like to kind of pull that data, um, imagine you have a little microservice or whatever that's, that's running that payment process. And you, you want to use kind of a typical queue. Um, here. So let's go over the deliver policy real quick. I don't think we need to do anything here because um, with the deliver policy, we want to be able to say, um, let's see, what did we use for the deliver policy? Um, say Jetstream. We want to deliver all of these, which is the default. Um, but you could also say, you know, uh, 
we could just deliver the new ones or we could deliver like the last ones. Um, you, you have some flexibility in terms of what you want your consumer to do when you fire it up. So this is a durable consumer. We want to whip through all of the data and make sure that we process all the pending payments. Um, we can delete all this stuff. Acknowledgement policy, we want to keep it ACK explicit, which is the default. Um, we can just leave all the stuff by default. Um, but you can configure all kinds of cool stuff, like you know whether you want to back off your typical kind of like job queue style um, back off policy. Uh, most importantly, you want to use a filter subject here. So um, NAS Jetstream has, we also have filter subjects. This is new. Um, so you could actually put multiple filter subjects in here. If I wanted to, I could just do this. And uh, we want to look at orders dot grade or star dot star. And we want to only look at the pending ones in this case. Similar to kind of what we did inside of that Benthos um, one. And we just want to process these one by one. I don't think we need any of these other things. Uh, but as you could see, there's a lot that you can configure here. Um, if you wanted to process these in batches, you could. This isn't a good example of something you'd want to process in batches uh, because payment processing is like, I want to pull one thing off and I want to go ahead and make sure it, it works. And, and you know when it does, then I can you know pull the next thing off. Um, the cool part about all of this is by default, you know, Nats consumers, they're all you know uh, easily horizontally scalable. Um, a consumer does not necessarily mean a process that's running against that consumer. You could just ru run as many processes as you want against that consumer. Um, so kind of different from uh, from like a Kafka. Kafka, it would be closer to like a Kafka consumer group, I guess. Um, and so this is a good example of like I'm going to pull in all of the, uh, the, the pending orders and process their payments and then decide what to do with it. Um, so... I can say uh, consumer.consume and I'm going to go ahead and add a message handler, which is that. And I can add any options I want, but really all I need to do is say, um, I want to acknowledge that message and I will say thumped.println um, receive the message. That's good. This is an interface now. And we need to, I don't want context.done. I want to, uh, sure. Can I do a graceful shutdown? Copilot, can you tell me to do that? Because I always forget how it works. Graceful shutdown. I don't want that. I want a, um, sure, yes, yes. Yes, that's what, exactly what I want. Um, I think it is a consume context and an error. There you go. Consume context. That's stop. And All right, that should be good. Okay, so what this is doing is we are creating or updating a consumer and then we are basically just processing all of these things one by one. We're acknowledging them. Typical kind of queue um, use case here. And, uh, and that's that. I think I'm just going to copy paste lots of this code. Um, so I'm just going to rename this to um, payment processor for now. And we'll just run all of these like go main. All right. Um, go run payment processor.go. And it should whip through and print all of those out one by one, acknowledging them one by one. And there's obviously, there we go. We're all done. So we've now successfully acknowledged all of those. The cool part is since we're using Synedia Cloud, and you could do this in the NAT CLI too, but since we're using Synedia Cloud, it's pretty easy for us to also just kind of inspect like, okay, what just happened here? Um, let's go over to Synedia Cloud. We'll go to consumers. We have our payment processing consumer. It looks like it's 
uh, found uh, 10,000 messages. The reason it's 10,000, if you can remember, is because we're only looking at the, the pending ones, right? So cool, we have a little payment processor consumer that's running. Um, and now we can kind of like flesh out all those other use cases and all this stuff can coexist. I could still have that payment processor running alongside of all the other consumers that are having their own little windows into these streams, which is which is marvelous. Um, so let's go ahead and um, I'll just copy paste all this code and we'll just uh, add another one called, what's our other use case that we want to, to support here? Um, let's go back to uh, our drawing. Where did our Excala draw go? Here it is. Um, so back on our drawing, we have kind of a reporting one. So this one will be actually kind of fun to do because it's very, very different than our typical um, kind of payment processing queue model where, you know, this one we just want to spin up an ephemeral because we just want to have an answer to a question. So like, let's figure out how to answer one of these. Um, how many orders were shipped to Canada. Let's say that. I have no idea. Does anybody have an idea how many orders were shipped to Canada? How many orders were delivered to Canada maybe? Let's see. Yeah. So how can we answer that question? Well, we can do so by just creating a consumer. So uh, delivered to Canada.go. Yeah, I know. I'm not factoring this stuff well at all. And I'm okay with that. Um, so we're just gonna call out main redeclare in this block, of course. Um, that's fine. My LSP is gonna complain, but my but Go will not. Um, Twenty five hundred. Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's let's find out. So we're going to create another consumer, and we're going to be consuming, but we're gonna be consuming stuff kind of differently here. So um, I'll just comment this stuff out. Actually, I don't need to comment. I'll just change it. So we'll have a new consumer here, and this is not gonna be a durable. We'll just name this. You know, um, I, we don't even have to give it a name if we don't want to, but we totally could. Um, we could just say like, you know, reporting. And if, if you are gonna be running this multiple times, like at the same time, oh, I realize you can't see my screen again. If you're gonna be running this multiple times at the same time, um, you know, you'll probably want to like put some sort of like random, um, some random string here, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna call this reporting. Um, Okay, and so uh, let's go ahead and give it a description. We'll say like um, how many um, orders have been delivered to Canada. Okay, and we want to look at all the delivered ones to Canada, and it doesn't really matter what the ID is, so we'll just you know do all of that. And we want to tweak this to be as efficient as possible. So right now we said we want to explicitly ACK all of these, and that's gonna be a lot slower because it means we're just gonna get one message delivered at a time. And that's no good because like that's kind of, you know, that's kind of a bummer. Um, so what we can do, and again, I'm just kind of YOLOing this. Obviously there's gonna be a lot more efficient ways to, to write this code. But um, what, what we'll do is we'll say, uh, Max act pending, we could set to, can I set this to negative one? I think you can. Um, well, no, you can't because it's an int. Um, but we could just put this at like an absurdly high number. Um, 100,000, sure, yep, because we don't even have that many messages. Um, and then we could go ahead and say that uh, our act policy is not act explicit, but it's going to be, um, we could actually say act none if we wanted to, which means like we won't get any message redeliveries. It will just try to deliver stuff and it really doesn't care whether or not it's acknowledged, um, which that, that could work as well. Um, and, and remember this is a poll consumer um, for those who are familiar, like we're, we're basically going to say gives, you know, the consumer itself is gonna start asking Jetstream for messages and Jetstream will start, you know, sending messages its way in a reply. Um, so I could set this to act none because it is reporting. I could also do like um, act all, which would, it would do, you know, essentially batch acts. Um, but I'm just gonna set this to act none for now. And then um, let's see, max deliver. We could probably also set this to a, a very high number. Um, and that's going to reduce like round trip times. Um, 
what am I missing? There's an extra colon here. So that's one of the cool things about all of this is that there's just a lot of really cool things that you can do here. I could set up a start time to say, hey, how many how many were delivered in Canada in the last seven days? Um, and so we could create like a really flexible, um, you know, essentially query language around this if we really wanted to. Would it be as fast as a relational database? No, probably not. Um, but in a lot of ways it could be good. And we again, we could reduce all this stuff to like a slow round trip time. The other cool thing that we could do if we wanted to optimize the what kind of comes over the wire is that we could say, um, we could just say headers only, true. And that way, because we don't really care about what's in the messages, we just care about account, right? Um, and then we can say, if, if we kind of max this out, we can, um, now I, I know this for myself that like, yeah, we have less than 10,000 uh, or less than 100,000 messages. So I could use consume and I could start like adding, I could start counting these up. Like that's a totally valid thing to do. I could say count is zero. And then I could say consumer.consume, .consume, um, continually receive messages and handle them with the provided callback function. Um, I don't have to acknowledge these anymore. So I could just literally just say like count plus plus. And then at the end here, I can, uh, I could say, there we go. Let's, uh, let's try that out. Shall we? What did I call this? Um, delivered to California or delivered to Canada? 25,000. Wait, that that's, oh, sorry. No, Mac act pending exceeds system limit. Okay, 25,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I can't say, let's just bump that up to the to the max. It doesn't really matter because I don't think we're, we have, an act, we have an act policy of none. So I don't even think we need to configure it anymore. There we go. Do, do, do. This is taking a long time. I think it's because I'm using the consume function um, or it's blocking somewhere. Um, it might be the max pull request that's freaking out. Um, so let's go ahead and try using a different function here. I could say consumer.fetch. Fetch no wait does uh, used to retrieve provided number of messages from a stream. This method will always send a single request and immediately return uh, the provided number. That's good if you're kind of like, you know, this is kind of a hot um, stream and you want to respond as quickly as possible. I could also just start fetching stuff in batches um, if I wanted to. So, you know, I could create a loop and I could start fetching in batches if I wanted to. Um, but consume allows me to do a lot of cool stuff as well um, and, and pull in kind of like a pull consume set of options. So let me see what's going on here. Um, I could say Jetstream uh, with get message subject with purge sequence with... Uh, it's not what I want. What are the consumer ops that I have? Mm -hmm. Here we go. So I have an error handler for consume, which I can use. Uh, so it's custom error handler invoked with an error in the counter while consuming messages. It'll be invoked for both terminal and non-terminal errors. Um, so there might be something going on there. I'll have to check it out. Um, fetch, that's for fetch options. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to figure out if consume is actually what I want here um, or if it's fetch. Because I could also just say fetch no wait and put a bunch of a huge batch there. I don't know how big the batch is that I could use, but let's Let's actually see what that looks like. Um, Consumer.fetch. And I can just say, and then I get a message batch. So what's a message batch? Puts messages into a channel. I can just whip through those, count them up if I wanted to, um, which is pretty cool. I also have sequences here um, from the fetch result app, but that's not there. So 
I still kind of want to use consume, but I wonder why that's not working the way that I would expect it to. Let's try it again. I could just be doing something dumb. Oh, yeah, I am doing something dumb. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to print here. There we go. 553. Um, so yeah, so this is one kind of way that you can um, that you can do that. And then obviously if I like put another one in there, it would just start counting. And so th that's kind of the nice thing about consumers is like um, it, not only can you count stuff, but from a reporting standpoint, it's like, it's live, right? So you can, you can get updates right away. So you could use it to kind of like, you know, create or derive data sets, but then you get live updates alongside it. And, you know, you don't want to do this at like super, super high scales. Like, you know, consumers are kind of heavyweight. I know we're trying to, um, we're, we're trying to kind of reduce the footprint that they have, but they are still kind of heavyweight. But, you know, if you're using an ephemeral consumer and you're using it for like reporting purposes, you're not going to have millions of people like, you know, going to a reporting UI. And so this is kind of a cool, um, potential use case for this, right? Where I could say, yeah, give me all the total orders delivered to Canada and also just keep it hot. Like whenever a new one comes in, update that value for me. Um, and I think that's one of the really neat things about um, about that. And we're just doing this from a filtering perspective. So this isn't durable. Like I can close this out and that consumer then goes away. Um, I fire this up and we get a consumer back and it will you know, count all those up for me. Um, unless actually this is this one is durable. Let's make sure I have, uh, the reason being is it's probably uh, cleaning that up a little bit later than, than I wanted to. There we go. Cool. So let's go over here to Synadia Cloud and we will take a look at that consumer. Orders, consumers, we have the reporting consumer and the messages that it's gotten. Um, and so it's it's just going to be waiting for stuff, which is cool. Um, and if I close it out, this thing will you know stay alive for a little while, just in case like there's some network jitter and stuff like that. But eventually, it will just fall off and decide it doesn't want to be there anymore, and it goes away. Fire up another one, it will recalculate for me. So pretty neat. Um, I think this is a pretty cool pattern. And um, I, like, you know, I'm going to try to figure out a, a cool way to, to describe it and implement it a little bit more. Um, I think this orders thing is interesting and I'm probably going to be using this data in my video that I'll record tonight. Um, but I think that's going to probably wrap it up for now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'll close out this stream unless anybody has any questions. I know we still have some like tw about 21 people on the stream um, from, you know, different places. Uh, and so if you guys do have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm also, I'm happy to draw whatever. So like, um, it doesn't have to be relevant to this particular stream. Uh, I'm happy to kind of explain any concepts that folks are, um, are interested in. One of the things that I think will be fun to do from a Synadia standpoint, um, and I might have to just sort, start by sourcing some questions from the community. Um, but I want to do more of these. But rather than me just hanging out and building, I'm, I'll do. I'll still do ones just like these. But I'd, I'd like to do AMAs where we can bring more of the Synadia crew on, more of the Nats maintainers on, um, possibly even just like you know, if we want to talk more about Benthos, we'll bring we'll bring Ash on, we'll bring have Mihai on, or something like that. We'll bring on Benthos maintainers. Um, but I would love to do more like Nats AMAs where you can like bring not just like easy questions, like bring hardball questions, like ones that we can. Um, that I can answer by saying, yeah, let's, let's start drawing something and let's start explaining. Um, and hopefully it gets good, it gets good and polished enough to the point where we can repurpose that into content that we could share via replays. Um, cause I know not, not all kind of stream content is worthy video content, but I would like to get to this point where stuff that I share on stream is, uh, good enough to also share, you know, in kind of a replay video format on YouTube and stuff like that. So if anybody has any questions, I'm going to hang out here for maybe about five more minutes. But if somebody does ask a question and it's meaty enough, I'd love to kind of go down that rabbit hole. So I don't know, what are you guys, what are you guys doing when you're playing with Nats? What are you struggling with or what questions can I help answer in terms of how Nats works, how Benthos works, how Jetstream works? 
Um, or what would you like to see more of? Uh, happy to kind of chat about any of that. Don't be shy. Okay. So we got orders. Let me take a net look at the other use cases as well. Oh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted. Is there a simple way to use Nats Micro with Jetstream? That's actually a really good question. Um, yeah, let me let me look at that one. Maybe some deep sightseeing about multi-site clustering. Yeah. Uh, Multi-site clustering is actually a really good topic, and um, you know it's it's a bit more opsy for sure. Uh, but it's it's let me show you right now like the results that you get from it because I think it's it's worth kind of pointing out. Um, so like I have Synedia Cloud here right now, and we had that stream right. We had this order stream. It's about nine megs, um, but it has one replica right. We made it easy on ourselves, but I can go edit this stream and I can bump the replicas up to three, let's say up, oh, not three max bytes. What am I doing? Bump the replicas up to three. And now I have a three, um, to have the right. Yeah. Three. Uh, now I'm going to have a replication factor of three and I can just hit save. Um, ah, oh, my account doesn't have the right sufficient amount of resources. Um, so we'll keep this as an R1, I guess. But uh, you can bump it up to three. I just don't have it correctly set up for this account. Uh, but here's the other cool thing that you could do is uh, right now this lives somewhere on a cluster. Actually, I could tell you right now, uh, I'll say Nats stream info for orders. And it lives in US East too. So like I said, Sineta Cloud and NGS, it lives on a... Uh, it has AWS support, has GCP support. So, so you could really start putting your data like close to wherever your applications live. Um, it has Azure support. Um, and then it has all of these different regions um, in all of those clouds that, that, that they support. And so let, let's say like I was writing an application and I was in GCP instead of, you know, AWS, I could actually change the cluster that this goes to. And, and here's, here's the wild part is like, not a lot of people know this, but like there's no downtime. Like this thing moves and still serves the consumers at the same time. Like that's wild. So I'm on, uh, where was I? I was in US East too. So like, what if I wanted to change this to, I don't know, GCP, like US East one, or maybe uh, Azure US West, um, cause I'm on the West coast, right? So let's, yeah, let's go do that. Um, so uh, Azure US West. I mean, I don't use Azure, but go ahead. So there you go. It's going to be moving. Um, let's let's see what's going on here. Um, oh, it's moved. <laughs> it's done. So yeah, if you have a big stream, it will take a little bit of time for it to replicate, but it, it, it does all of that stuff under the hood. All the leadership, it can still write, it can still read. So consumers, publishers, all that stuff just works under the hood, but I literally just moved it to a new data center. I moved it to a new cloud. Like how cool is that? Um, so that's kind of, you know, I think it would be cool to cover more subjects around how do you build that cluster yourself. But like, there's just so many cool things that you can get out of a, like having a global cluster or having a, you know, multi-site cluster. Maybe it's, maybe you're not working in clouds. Maybe you need to connect multiple sites. You know, these could be data centers. These could, these could be different offices or locations or edge locations. Um, there, there's so much benefit in clustering. Not only that, but if you're doing stuff at the edge, we even have the concept of leaf nodes. And so, I'm sure, you know, some of you guys already know a ton about leaf nodes and that's great, but just to kind of go over it, um, quickly leaf nodes are cool because they allow you to say, uh, what if I don't want a cluster you know, or maybe I already have my cluster, but, 
Um, you know, clusters are really meant for inter regional communications and super clusters kind of allow you to like group the different clouds or the different um, regions together, right? But then like, what if you want something that's just like, I'm my own NAT, I'm my own NATs or I'm my own, I'm my own NATs cluster. Maybe this thing lives at the edge somewhere and it's doing its own thing, but it still wants to like play with nicely with the cluster. That's where a leaf node comes in. And it's honestly like the coolest, like, one of the coolest parts of Nats, and I don't know who else does this as well, but um, you can have this, and this doesn't have to be a single node, by the way. This could be like a, this could be its own cluster. It can be a bridge between clusters without it feeling like it has to be a super cluster, or you know that it acts as a single system. Because there's there are some pretty important differences between you know what a leaf node does and what a standard Nats cluster does. Um, typically, they have their own you know security domains. So you could be, this thing could be, you know, your, um, this is a perfect example, actually. So this thing could be like your internal, like company, like cluster. And maybe all of your like microservices connect to this thing, but it's like all inside of your VPC, right? But then you're like, oh, we want to do that cool reporting thing for our users. And we want them to like connect to Nats from the browser, and and then then you go to your security team, and you're like, yeah, yeah, we want we want everybody who's in their browser to be able to connect to our Nats cluster, and then your security person is just like, wait, no, um, don't do that. Like, we don't want to punch holes through our VPC so people on their browsers can connect. So this is where things get cool is because you could actually spin up a leaf node or even a completely separate cluster. And this users totally do this um, where they say, okay, this is like our connection cluster. Um, and this is where all, everybody's browsers who's browsing the internet will connect into. Um, and so, and it has a completely different security model, meaning you have full control over what goes over this wire over here. Um, these guys can still connect and interact with your microservices in a really safe way. Um, but like it reduces the blast radius because for some reason something goes wrong over here, it's not going to bring this down. Uh, and that's so cool. Um, like I, I don't, I don't know what other technology really gives you that amount of flexibility in terms of how to, how to do all that stuff. Um, and so we, we see a lot of people use that as a model where they're like, they'll have a separate cluster, or even separate nodes to kind of like handle all the client connections from like a front end or from a mobile app. Um, and, and the neat part about that is all of the features of, of Nats, of Jetstream, of, of all of that, they all kind of still work here. So like I can do stuff where it's like, I have all my Jetstreams over here and maybe this has no Jetstreams. Maybe this is just regular Nats that's, that's doing all of it. Sure, you could still use Jetstream to kind of like, go all the way over here and pull the data and bring it back. But the the neat part about this is I could also say, okay, maybe I do want the leaf node to have Jetstream, but it's never creating its own Jetstreams. It's always just replicating the Jetstreams that it needs on the leaf node. And you could do that with sourcing, sourcing and mirroring. Um, so there's just like, I don't know, there's an unbelievable amount of flexibility. And I agree with whoever said that uh, they want to talk more about like, multi-site stuff because it's yeah it's it's a deep rabbit hole and we could talk about all of this stuff for literally forever um okay cool i got a couple more questions um okay yeah i'll answer the the is there a simple way to use nats micro with jetstream let me explain nats micro just really quick because i think it's a it's a good topic um so on, on the outset it would, it would so what's nats micro <laughs> yeah let's start with that so I, I created a video on, on we call it Nats Micro. We now call it just Nats like service, um, Nats services. It's like the Nats services package, Nats services library. I think we're still trying to come up with a name with it. We're trying to get rid of the micro name, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what sticks. Um, but like, okay, building microservices in Nats. So like, what, what does that afford you? Well, one of the things about Nats is that it facilitates what we call M to end communication. What does that mean? Well, if you were to just use HTTP as an example, where pretty much what everybody's building their services on. Sure, there's like gRPC and junk like that, but it's all kind of just HTTP under the hood. Um, this stuff is mostly one-to-one. -one. 
Meaning if you want this guy to be able to communicate with this guy, you're going to need something. There's some knowledge that needs to happen here, right? Um, what's that knowledge? That knowledge is, you know, what's its IP address? And there's multiple ways to get at that IP address, right? You can use DNS, you can use service discovery, but, and DNS is obviously ubiquitous, but it's slow, it's error prone, it's the source of many cloud outages in a lot of places. So we try to avoid DNS when possible. Sure, we use DNS when we connect into a NATS cluster and stuff like that, but once you're connected into NATS, like you can say bye-bye to DNS, you don't need it anymore. Um, even when you do use DNS, you still have to like figure out, okay, what services are where and what do they do? And so like that, this is the, the, essentially the problem that we run into and what kind of motivated us to say like, okay, how do we rethink what it looks like to create microservices, especially with NATs? And so we know HTTP is limited in the sense that it has like this one-to-one -one communication. NATs on the other hand is M to N, meaning like I can have one or many or really zero or many services that can talk to zero or many other services and all that stuff. This is gonna be a bad diagram, but just bear with me here. All, and all that stuff just kind of works seamlessly, right? Um, and, and, and this is kind of like the, the, the crux of what motivated kind of, wow, we could build cool microservices with, with this system. Um, and so, what I want all this to say, like the way I want to describe kind of NAT's services is the fact that we lean on this pattern of M to N to drive a lot of the functionality. And, and a lot of it just makes the functionality and how we build it, like it's all convention, if that makes sense. So um, let's talk for a second about like NAT's request reply. So how does request reply work, right? because this is what basically what, what services is, is really using under the hood. It's also what Jetstream uses under the hood. Jetstream is essentially just a service. Yeah, we build some client support for it, so it makes it a lot easier to, to interact with, but like um, you can do all kinds of cool stuff like uh, you know, uh, Nats stream list, and I'm gonna say trace. There, let's pull this up. Um, here we go. I'm going to say Nats stream list trace. And what this is going to do is that actually going to show me it just called a Jetstream API, which is cool. It's just calling a subject. Like it's all just Nats. It's, it's literally like just like Rust is turtles all the way down. Like <laughs> Nats is turtles all the way down when it comes to subjects and messages. Like these two core primitives. All the other stuff that have been built on top of this, Jetstream and Micro and like all the new stuff coming, the schema registry, like all of this is just going to be subjects and pub sub essentially under the hood. The problem with us calling it pub sub is that like people have some preconceived notions of what pub sub means. So we try, we try to stay away from calling it pub sub, but in reality it is pub sub. Um, and so like how does request reply work then? Well, let's say you have one client here and you have another client here and it makes, client one makes a request and the response comes. And these are just all subjects and messages under the hood. That's, that's really all that it is. Um, so, you know, you publish to a subject and the reply is somebody else publishing to a subject that this person's, you know, subscribed to. And Nats under the hood does some cool, on both on the client and on the server, like some cool optimization to make sure that like it's not like being inefficient about how it performs this operation, but that's essentially all that it is. You have an inbox subject that is like, here's how I receive, you know, my replies that that client, you know, sets up. And this client, the responder simply just responds into that inbox. It's really straightforward. Um, I wish I had more time to talk about this, but I just realized I have a kid that I have to go pick up from the bus. So, uh, Thanks everybody for hopping on. We'll, we'll talk more about, I'll answer more of these questions and we'll talk more about NAT services in a future stream. Um, but yeah, thanks for uh, jumping in and um, have a great weekend and I'll see y'all later. Bye.